Hello, everybody, and welcome. Happy Earth Day. We are so glad that uh, all you guys out there were able to join us for this very special Earth Day event, uh, one of many events happening all around the world this week and this month to celebrate the 51st anniversary of Earth Day. My name is Jeremy. Uh, I work as an education assistant here at Fisk Planetarium, and I'll be doing all the tech stuff uh, behind the scenes for this event tonight. Uh, this event tonight is going to have two main parts. Uh, first, we have our guest lecture today by uh, my, the, my friend down below us, Skip Leitner, followed by a premiere of our film Climate Change in Our Backyard, and then a Q&A with the film team afterwards. If you're joining us live tonight, we're going to be monitoring the YouTube chat uh, either on the right or maybe below, depending on how you're watching. Uh, so any questions you guys have along the way, feel free to drop those in the chat and we'll make sure we either store them for the Q&A at the end or maybe we can respond as we go. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Brianna Ingerman, who is our Education Programs Manager here at Fisk. Brianna? Thanks, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight with us. We're really grateful and excited to have you all here. Today, especially, we consider our connections to the Earth and the billions of lives that, we have, been, that have been sustained by our planet. As we do so, we must also recognize that here in the United States, there are many indigenous nations that are the original stewards of these lands. They have developed profoundly deep knowledge systems in relationship to the earth and learned to live sustainably in a way that Western civilization frankly hasn't. We would like to specifically acknowledge that Fisk is located on the traditional territories of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute nations, and affirm the painful history that has led to their displacement. These actions of our past continue to negatively impact these communities, and the respectful stewardship of these lands have suffered as a result. May we learn from these mistakes of the past and, and listen to collective knowledge in order to create a more sustainable future. So in this spirit, we're glad to bring you this event tonight. So several months ago, I was crowdsourcing, reaching out, looking for creative climate solutions that people don't often hear about. This was for developing a new educational program. And through the grapevine, Skip here uh, reached out. And since then, we've engaged in several compelling conversations about new technologies can, that can effectively run on ambient energy that's around us all the time this idea of energy harvesting and how this leads to benefits for people and for the economy at large. Skip Leitner is an international resource economist who in 2012 founded Economic and Human Dimensions Research Associates, which is based in Tucson, Arizona. He's a researcher, author, lecturer, and a consultant. He's also a past president of the Association of Environmental Studies and Sciences an independent interdisciplinary professional association in higher education. Skip also serves as chief economist for third industrial revolution master plan initiatives spearheaded by well-known author and visionary Jeremy Rifkin. Skip, welcome. We're so glad to have you and uh, thank you so much for being here with all of us today. Uh, Brianna, yes, delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation and uh, dare I say the, uh, the collaboration. Um, as I'm beginning to think about uh, the task at hand, uh, yes, I'm going to be talking through, as you're suggesting, rethinking energy and asking the question whether it's uh, time to reinvent the wheel. I'll throw some stories your way, some images, some very big numbers, hopefully in a fun or at least intriguing kind of way, but I'm going to begin opening on somewhat of a somber note. I do this to emphasize the very real need to pay attention to what is happening and to get it done. And what I mean by getting it done, uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. But I'm also highlighting some exciting, maybe even some fun new ways, as you suggest, of getting it done. Again, more to come. Much of this talk is actually based in the spirit and the tradition of Nobel laureate and former Caltech physicist Richard Feynman, who gave a remarkable lecture in 1959, plenty of room at the bottom. Imagine this. In 1959, well before the internet, before we knew things like carbon fiber materials or fiber optics, Feynman was exploring the idea of whether it was possible to store the entire Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pen. And he suggested, yes, it is possible. This was in 1959, 30 years before IBM scientist Don Eigler learned in 1989 
how to manipulate 35 xenon atoms under a microscope to spell out the letters of IBM. And as we've highlighted in the abstract for this talk, uh, sometimes we actually do need to reinvent the wheel to move us forward. And in this case, we need to step back and rethink both energy, what I call energy productivity, and look for new, new techniques, as you've alluded, uh, to energy harvesting, new approaches in, the many, in pulling many forms of energy out of the ambient environment around us, rather than mining coal and uranium or drilling for oil and gas. And in that spirit, I encourage everybody to read Feynman's very provocative lecture. There's not a single equation in it, and it's a highly readable text, so there should be no excuse not to take a good look at it, read it through. At this point, however, I want to acknowledge so many people who have asked me good questions or have given me some really amazing insights or different ways of seeing the world, uh, teaching this old dog to learn some new tricks. Three things in this regard. Yes, there are a lot of people. I could add any number more, family, friends, colleagues, but here I've listed maybe, if my counting is right, a hundred different people. And I do so to emphasize the need for a more collaborative, more in interactive engagement as it affects ideas, as it affects ways of getting it done, as it affects our different channels of sharing the many benefits within our distinctive communities. Second, and a really important point, I don't think I could have said this 15 years ago, but of the 100 names I've got here on the screen today, a total of 50 of those individuals are women serendipitously in exactly half of the total. Yes, as I've seen personally, a growing collaboration in many different ways, as we need to look for a greater diversity of people engaged in these topics, these discussions. So might we imagine a more collaborative and engaging way of getting it done? Again, with more to explain shortly. And third, I highlight one name in particular, uh, the Gilets Jaunes, the Mouvement des Gilets Jaunes, the Yellow Vest Movement in France. They got their name from fluorescent yellow jackets that all motorists in France must carry by law in their cars. As you've suggested, and many people may not be aware, but a lot of my work is undertaken in the international community, whether down under in Australia or New Zealand, whether China, East Asia, even Russia. No, your bank accounts won't be hacked by listening to this uh, evening here, but especially in Europe. And although not recently, I've engaged in various conversations and talked with members of the Gilets Jaunes. Their movement erupted because French President Emmanuel Macron proposed a fuel tax about three years ago to aid the French in the transition to green energy. But he did so independently of engaging people, of explaining the need to them to engage at the community level. And he proposed the fuel charge without providing them with the means to respond to that price signal. So the signal became a form of punishment. They reacted. I learned in conversation with several of the Gilets Jaunes, they do care about climate and doing things in eco-friendly ways but they have really not been included, nor have they been given the means to easily do the things in different ways. And that discussion has imparted some powerful and significant insights for me as we address climate change, the issue, and our social economic well-being from many different perspectives. So long, long story short, we cannot merely implement policy without giving people and communities the ability to understand also the resources, the wherewithal to respond to that policy and the means that means we've got to actually engage them in conversation and, and uh, help, help them be affected by that positive or that policy in a positive way, a highly collaborative engagement with an open narrative. Again, more will come out in the comments that follow. But with that, back to the more somber backdrop, I wanna take you to the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. I wanna talk about the seeds of the Dust Bowl in the heartland of America. They've been sowed maybe in the 1920s with a mistaken belief not unlike in some ways today, that more rain was the new normal, that the superstition of our manifest destiny ruled our future, and the mistaken belief that rain follows the plow. But an economic depression coupled with extended drought and unusually high temperatures, poor agricultural practices, plowing up way too many acres of soil, and the resulting wind erosion all contributed to the making of the Dust Bowl. And I want to take you now back to April 14th, 1935. Black Sunday, with as many as 3 million tons of topsoil on that single day, estimated to have blown off the Great Plains during that day, all over the United States, as far away as Washington, D.C. and New York City. In the Dust Bowl, roughly 2.5 million people left the states of Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, during those 1930 periods, the dirty 30s, as we call it, it was one of the largest migrations 
in American history. And we're about to do it again, only worse. And it reminds me of that Pete Seeger song, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? And with a closing refrain, when will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? Hopefully we can learn here today. So from the Dust Bowl back to March 2021, temperatures have been rising steadily, especially since the mid 1980s. Uh, March 2021 was the 435th consecutive month in which global average temperatures were above normal. My daughter, who will turn 32 next month, was not even alive the last time temperatures were normal, even below normal. And here is a worrisome statistic I researched from NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, their Ocean Climatic Laboratory, documents that since the 1980s, our oceans have absorbed the heat equivalent to 300 times the global annual energy consumption of our, our, of our world. And if we don't stop, the worst is yet to come. At the same time, the evidence suggests that there is a, an economy that may be slowly eroding out from under us. It's almost as if we tend to accept a more optimistic view of the future, indeed, that we benefit from our manifest destiny and desire an annual economic growth rate of 3% a year. So let's step back and examine a set of recent projections and actual outcomes. And some of the first big numbers in the year 2005, our economy is just under $15 trillion. We had 176 million people at work. Those include wage and salaries, government, includes uh, self-employed proprietors and the like. And we thought 3% a year. So a standard projection said by the year 2020, we might grow to just under $24 trillion with 200 million plus jobs. But the actual outcome, thanks both to the uh, housing problem in the 2007-8-9 period, but also the pandemic, the actual outcome was a much weaker $18.4 billion trillion with fewer than 200 million jobs. At the same time, the resource debt has been building up. We produce a waste of 50 tons per person in this country, wasted energy, wasted soil, fecal matter, and dumping into the landfills. That is beginning to create a burden that's slowing and eroding uh, the well-being of our economy. So in that sense, the good news is, yes, there is hope. And I want to celebrate almost immediately the winner of the Department of Energy Solar Decathlon. That's a big event in which students from all over the United States gather to design and build new homes. So I want to congratulate CU Boulder, their team, together with my colleague, Kristen Tedonio, and her husband, Joe Smith, up there in Fraser. They built an amazing home that is really uh, what we call the SPARK home. SPARK is an acronym for sustainability, performance, attainability, resilience, and community. It's a transition between active energy forms and energy harvesting we'll talk about. It's a home that combines really good design and insulation with both active solar, converting light into electricity or what we call photovoltaics, passive solar energy by pulling heat gain in various ways, even at minus 13 degrees below zero a net zero home for the middle class. In other words, doesn't need any external source of energy. It's entirely provided on site, costing a bit less to build, even as the home can also power a small electric vehicle for local use. So with that success and congratulations to, again, CU Boulder, to Kristen and to Joe, a really well done job. Let me then ask, what might we imagine the record fuel economy for a research test car might be with an internal combustion engine? or an engine of any sort. The entire fleet of the United States automobiles now average about 24, 25 miles per gallon. So what could we imagine be a good fuel economy that might be possible? Some might think 75 miles a gallon, maybe 150 miles a gallon, perhaps a really wild guess it's 10 times that amount. And that is moving in the right direction. But some students uh, with my colleague um, at the Oxford University in the UK entered in 2013, the Shell Eco Marathon, driving a test vehicle that was an electric vehicle that uh, also powered in part by PV, photovoltaic electricity. And mind you, uh, it was a test car, not one we'd normally see driving around our, 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 our streets here in, in Tucson or there in Boulder, but it reached in 2013, the amazing 12,646 miles per gallon. And that's not even the Guinness Book of Records. That was 2013 and 2018 students at Duke University designed and drove a hydrogen power car that got the equivalent of 14,573 miles per gallon. And we're still limited to thinking maybe 50 or 100 miles per gallon. So we need to be thinking about the road ahead. 
It turns out that if we look at our energy use, we are wholly inefficient, both globally and in the United States. We waste more than 80% of the electricity, the energy we use in supporting our economy. So that leaves us with an unfortunate circumstance as Tom Friedman, New York Times columnist said some time back, we either have a hard decade, a decade, 10 years to really get things underway, to get things done, or we're gonna have a very bad century in terms of worsening climate, air pollution, and a slow erosion of our social economic well-being. In that regard, I gotta acknowledge, I'm delighted that President Biden has announced the idea of cutting carbon emissions in the US within that next decade. It's gonna be a hard decade, or it's gonna be even a really bad century. So we're gonna be talking about things called energy productivity and energy harvesting. We're gonna be talking about survival of the friendliest and talking with scientists, anthropologists, sociologists, and others. We are learning that is not at all survival of the fittest, but really what I call survival of the friendliest. That cooperation, collaboration, and awareness of the larger world around us matters so much more than a strong, agile, or dominant warrior. So all of this underscoring the need, a better narrative, dialogue, and view of things that stimulate our imagination, our trust, a common understanding of the energy resource imperativeness, imperatives, and a big willingness to act both today and tomorrow. But at this point, I want to turn now to my favorite, not my favorite physicist, but my favorite American philosopher, Gary Larson from the far side. He's going to help us understand that small differences in assumptions can lead to very big differences in outcomes. So we have a dog in the backseat of his master's car talking to his friend in the front yard. He's saying, aha, Biff, guess what? After you go to the drugstore and the post office, I'm going to the vets to get tutored. Small differences in assumptions can lead to very big differences in outcomes. Or as my colleague and coworker Desiree Rose tells me, that if I had a dime, she had a dime for every thought experiment I came up with, she might be able to actually fund a real experiment. And I told her, well, perhaps a dollar rather than a dime, but I'm about to deliver something, what I call a very big Fermi thought experiment. Enrico Fermi was a theoretical experimental physicist back in the 40s who was famous for creating ways of looking at the world in new fashions with new possible outcomes. So in that very big experiment experience, and as we are beginning to heat up the sky, filling it with greenhouse gases, air pollution, and the like. Let me ask you, what the heck is 4 trillion, 104 billion, 594 million, 437,832 dollars? And you say, huh? What is that? It's a very big number. Uh, interestingly, it is um, a number that is the result of inefficient use of energy. Since the Earth Summit in 1992, the real Earth Summit, when nations of the world first came together, to begin addressing climate change, we've averaged about 2% a year in energy efficiency improvement. It's okay, but it has still led to the dumping of large air pollution greenhouse gas emissions. We could have saved that $4.1 trillion by averaging not 2% efficiency a year, but 3% energy productivity gains a year. That's a big number. That is about 20 some percent of our yearly GDP. That is more money than the governments, whether state, local, or federal government spent in a given year. So imagine, had we been able to save that kind of money and put it to other good uses, spending on education, healthcare, and other goods and services, the things we really care about, just two things alone could have gotten us to this savings if we had demanded it beginning in 1992. And by the way, that number is as of seven o'clock Mountain Daylight Time, the beginning of this lecture. It's increasing about seven or $8,000 a second, a very big number that continues to grow. But had we demanded in 1992 that we generate more of our electricity from renewables and we had better fuel economy, we've been able to save. So in, today we're about 20% of our electricity from renewable energy. Had we said in 1992, we want to get to 85% by 2020, that would have taken us a very big way to saving that kind of money. And had we cars that don't get 25 miles per gallon, but this old Prius, this is my car, I bought it in 2001, it gets 45 miles per gallon. Had we said in 1992, we want the fuel economy of cars, all cars on average, not trucks, but just cars, to rise to 45, million, 45 miles per gallon. Greater renewables, greater fuel economy cars could have gotten us there 
today. So we would have been saving a cumulative four trillion dollars had we really demanded that. So yes, it costs a lot more when I bought it, but I've saved, I'm estimating nine or ten thousand dollars in lower fuel costs. So bottom line, if you get the same work or service out of it, a kilowatt hour saved is so much greater than a kilowatt hour burned. A gallon of gasoline saved is so much greater than a gasoline burned in our car. Let's take a step back and understand a little bit more how these energy losses mount. So electricity, we have things like coal going into a power plant, creating steam. It's a very expensive way to boil water, but about 70% of that energy is wasted heat in the form of greenhouse gases, in the form of heat, in the form of air pollution. We've actually improved a little bit better. So instead of a 30% net gain, we may be up to 35%. But it turns out what we waste in this country in the production of electricity alone, just the waste of producing electricity is more than Japan requires to power its entire economy for a year. That's a huge amount of money, a huge amount of energy. At the same time, we can say, what about cars? In the 1930s, we were able to produce about 100 barrels of oil for every barrel of oil produced. Today, we're down to maybe 12 or 15 barrels of oil for every barrel of oil of gasoline that goes into the car engine losses, drivetrain losses, air conditioning, water pump, alternators, radio, other devices in the car, idling of the car takes that energy input and we get maybe 18 to 25 percent net. Again, that means about 75 to 80 percent or more in losses in the form of heat, greenhouse gas emissions and the like. So given that perspective, huge amount of losses, more than 80% of our total energy in our economy, maybe we need what I call a different look at things. I'm going to take you a step back. In 1951, President uh, Truman created what was known as the Materials Policy Commission, or we call it the Paley Commission, notably because it was headed in by CBS Chairman William Paley. After a careful study and review, the Paley Commission determined that there were two sources of energy that would alleviate the demand for foreign oil. Those two sources were uranium and solar energies. In this report, you see the cover, which I have this report in hand, released in 1952, the commission said it favored solar energy, not nuclear. They said opportunities, and I quote, opportunities to harness solar energy economically are infinitesimally large. It is time for aggressive research in the field of solar energy and effort and effort in which the United States could make an immense contribution toward the welfare of the free world. But alas, President Eisenhower and others disregarded the recommendations of the Paley Commission. Solar energy was seen as something of an ugly duckling. Of the two forms of energy, only uranium fit the existing engineering systems of high temperature concentrated energy forms. In the minds of policymakers, solar energy was seen as too diffuse, too low temperature applications could not easily be substituted in existing power plants or fuel uses. So it was summarily dismissed. But as we're now seeing, it has emerged as a full grown, a delightful and very beautiful swan, or maybe a set of swans, which might help it fly if we choose to make it happen with not only solar, better energy efficiency, but also energy harvesting, resource productivity writ large. So what constitutes greater energy productivity? Well, three things really. One is the familiar things we're aware of, the better end use efficiency, better fuel economy in our cars or our trucks, uh, better air conditioning systems for sure, better lighting systems, all the end use efficiencies. That's part of energy productivity. A second part is the conversion of our electricity system to renewables because when we burn coal, we get three units of energy in to get one unit of energy out. That's a huge loss. Again, what we waste in the production of electricity more than Japan needs to power its entire economy. So converting to renewables directly, a huge savings there by itself, but also the more productive use of things like capital. Cars sit idle most of the time. Power plants are idle on average about half the time. Inefficient use of capital, inefficient use of materials in the construction of our, our goods and our buildings, but also the inefficient use of water and food. All of that constitutes greater energy productivity. And what is it that greater energy productivity can provide us? Well, we step back and really ask the question and really look. We find that it can produce us with a healthier climate and environment. It has fewer costs that save us money that can be spent on something like education or healthcare. 
and it provides us with the opportunity for more employment, a more resilient and more sustainable economy. And studies are out there underlining this with not enough time to go into detail. But then we turn to this thing called energy harvesting. How does that complement what we're talking in the world of energy productivity and what might that play in the future of our energy mix? I'm talking to you as a resource economist. I'm not a materials engineer or an electronics engineer, but as a resource economist saying we need new resources to be brought forward to harvest and to be in play as we're supporting our economy, our economic well-being in new ways. So we are talking about things like light waves, converting light waves into power. We're talking about thermal energy, converting heat into various forms of energy and power. We're talking about kinetic energy, movement of energy uh, into electricity and forms of power. And we're talking about radio waves, believe it or not, that can be converted into power our devices like our iPhones and things of that nature. Many different ways of doing it. But the key insight is that energy and resource productivity is larger than generally understood or believed. I'm about to throw some really big numbers at you here, and I apologize. The big number is a quad. That's one billion, one million billion British thermal units. One quad is on average sufficient energy to meet the needs of about 5.9 million homes for an entire year, or one quad could be used to power about 17 million cars in the United States for one year. In 1950, total energy use in the United States was about 35 quads. By 1970, we almost doubled that to 68 quads. Very big numbers. And thanks to the pandemic, we are now down to, from 100 down to 93. But let's step back and look at this thing called, big numbers called quads. And I'm gonna base this on a number of studies I've done over the years with colleagues. And there's the numbers on the left, the vertical axis, quads. And typical forecast by economists and policymakers before 1980 said, well, we're using 78 quads, 78 big numbers today, but we really got to go to 150 of those numbers by the year 2050. More supply, more supply, more supply. About the same time, a number of us, colleagues like Amory Lovins, my colleagues at the American Council for Energy Efficient Economies, many others at Stanford University said, you know, we could imagine a low energy future in 1980. The engineers laughed. They said, that's beyond the pale. It's unbelievable. You don't understand the engineering or the physics. And yet when we look at the actual historical consumption, it turns out how we actually began using energy because we passed things like appliance efficiency standards, better fuel economies for cars. We did things that led to more efficient use of energy. It followed the low energy scenario path in the early years. It led our colleagues at the Department of Energy as they published in 2005, their annual energy outlook. They said, well, maybe we don't need 150 quads, 150 big numbers. By 2025, maybe we'll get away with 125 only. And the most recent projection, the annual energy outlook of 2021, they said, well, we could even do well, just maybe 110 quads, 110 big units of energy. But they're overlooking the idea enabled by information communication technologies, new materials, new technologies, innovative behaviors, all spurred by better investment, education, science, and, and healthcare opportunities, all catalyzed by smart policies, productive investments, all amplified by this thing we call energy harvesting. And the question, can energy harvesting really contribute to the greater likelihood of a more beneficial outcome? I think you'll agree at the end, the answer is yes. But adapted from a study I did some years ago, we have a tendency to live more by waste than ingenuity. Remember I said that we would I waste over 80% of the energy we throw at the economic process, meaning 16 to 19% of our global uh, energy is all that we use putting goods and services into the hands of consumers and businesses. We waste a lot of energy. When we think about efficiency, we tend to think about yesterday's perspective in a limited way. Conventional assumptions about his efficiency potential tend to limit our ability to enact and to demand better outcomes. So exploring this idea of energy productivity, energy harvesting potential, the energy we don't use because we're more productive could equal 900 or more billion barrels of oil equivalent for the global economy through the year 2050, enough to reduce world energy demand by 40% or more. Imagine that with a prospect for a more robust, a more resilient and a more sustainable economy. And back into some specific forms of this thing called energy harvesting. Again, I'm throwing out some examples. Uh, I'm not a material scientist, but I've studied this enough to believe if we make a demand and we incentivize 
and being, bring about new ways of discovering and launching, we could enact some different things. One of my favorite is the idea of how we might imagine radiative cooling materials. Imagine a, a layer of different materials, very familiar materials, but they conduct heat in a way that enable that heat to be within a very narrow infrared magnetic, infrared magnetic, electromagnetic uh, range that allows that heat to escape the atmosphere into the cold of the sky above the world. It can reduce air conditioning needs by 20%, 10 to 20% anyway. So it's part of the system. If we imagine this kind of radiative cooling materials together with a more efficient air conditioning, that's a step in the right direction. Other available sources of energy on pavements and use of harvest energy. We're talking here temperature gradients to create thermoelectricity. We're talking about temperature variation for pyroelectricity. We're talking about stress and strain because of load traffic that creates mechanical pressures that can be converted into piezoelectric materials. We have solar radiation where the roads themselves have uh, the opportunity to be photovoltaic systems as part of the, instead of asphalt. Uh, the cars and trucks drive over that. So many different ways of bringing it to bear. Piezoelectric dance floors. Imagine that as people energetically dance on materials that create a mechanical pressure that can be then transferred into electricity to power the lights and the music and the like. We actually have energy harvesting electronics and textiles. Yes, materials thin enough that we could even tattoo them eventually under our skin or probably better done, become part of our clothing so that they provide the power for our things like iPhones and the like. And we have things we call agrovoltaics, the combination of photovoltaics together with new ways of producing food so that the, the photovoltaic cells above can shade, can reduce evaporation of water. The food below is grown in a hardy, interactive sort of way, melding into a new system of agricultural production or what we call photovoltaics. We have so many reservoirs and lakes and places that people don't swim or need to uh, boat on, but we can cover those with PV systems that are cooled by the water, which makes them operate more efficiently. And they in turn prevent evaporation of those reservoirs to reduce the waste of water ahead of times. New materials can bring this about more equivalently. But what is the material gain with energy harvesting and greater energy productivity? It's not the energy we use, but how productive we use it. I'm gonna throw some more big numbers at you here. So I'm exploring the link on the bottom axis, the horizontal axis, how energy productivity, the number of dollars per GDP we benefit from every million BTUs of energy versus on the vertical axis, how our income has risen over time. A very powerful relationship between the more productively we use energy, the more we're enabling for capita incomes to increase over time. The bad news is that there's a slow diminishing return we need to invest in and produce much more in the way of new materials, new designs, more productive use of these resources. So how big can we go? Well, that really depends. It's how big do we choose to go? It's our choice, it's our demands that can make this possible. So with energy harvesting, we can imagine a big opportunity should we choose to pursue it. But we have people in the audience who say, what if it's a hoax? What if we create a better world for nothing? Or in this cartoon from USA Today back in 2009, imagine things like energy independence, preserving our rainforests, sustainability, many more green jobs, livable cities, healthy children and the like, even apart from the climate. So we have the burden of climate on the one hand, but a healthier, more resilient economy on the other. Three things, I think, um, underscore our biggest resource or three, three ways of looking at the world. Lionel Strachey was a UK essayist in the 1900s, and he noted then in the early 1900s, Americans guess because they're in too great a hurry to think. I think that's still true today. We have then Jerry Hirschberg, who was founder and president of C Nissan International Design, building auto bodies, designing auto bodies for cars to be produced for Nissan. He said, creativity is not an escape from discipline thinking, rather it's an escape with discipline thinking. And then finally we have Henry Ford. I'm not a big fan of Henry Ford's, but he did say something quite insightful. Thinking is the hardest work there is, which is the probable reason why so few engage in it. I think that continues to be true today. 
And maybe a last word from not my favorite physicist, but again, my favorite American philosopher, Gary Larson. Here we have a dog in a high wire act juggling a bunch of things. One of them looks to be, I can't imagine, but it may be a dead cat. But the dog is thinking, high above the hushed crowd, Rex tried to remain focused. Still, he couldn't shake one nagging thought. He was an old dog, and this was a new trick. Or in the form of Maynard Keynes, who wrote the book in the 1930s, A General Theory, English economist, the difficulty lies not with the new ideas, but in escaping the old ones. Or as two colleagues of mine who heard me give a similar talk in 2013 in Zurich, Switzerland, quick sketch artist drew this graphic, the difficulty is to escape the old ideas. I think that remains true today. So we're throwing a lot of numbers at you, a lot of ideas, a lot of images and stories. Thank you very much. With the only thought that let's make it happen. With that, back to you, Brenna. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Skip. Uh, really enlightening talk. And um, I'm really appreciating your point of you know, doing the hard work over the next uh, decade, right? And applying our thinking to how we can move forward and escape old ideas. Um, so at this point, we're gonna take questions from the chat. So if you're um, watching us live, you can go ahead and uh, type in your questions in the chat box. We'll make sure we relay them. And while we're kind of waiting, um, one question that I have is, you know, you mentioned a bunch of these energy harvesting techniques and ideas and technologies. How much are those really in the realm of sort of the future? It's these um, kind of more theoretical ideas that are being developed right now versus actually uh, being developed and used frequently? Good question. Where energy harvesting is relatively new. It didn't really begin to take off until the late uh, 2008, 2009, ironically after the housing crisis. But ideas were beginning to surface, and we have some very capable material scientists, material engineers, uh, electronic uh, scientists, scientists who work with information that manage materials, manage information flows across those materials. And in the labs, they're really starting to come out in a very big way. The question is, can we open the markets and can we invest in those opportunities and put more people to work? It's really more about an investing of our future uh, that makes this sort of thing possible. So the reality is there, we can do it. It's kind of like um, my colleague, uh, former representative David Osterberg from Iowa. In the 1980s, he introduced a bill, which I'm happy to say I lobbied in favor of in the 1980s. That is the reason Iowa is today a leading wind producing state. We didn't think that wind had a big future, but by introducing the incentives, the motivation, the foundation in the 1980s, Iowa now generates over 53% of its electricity from wind power. Energy harvesting is in that same basis, that same foundation, if we choose to make it happen. And that's really the critical issue. Choose to make it happen, make the investments in people as well as the technologies. Definitely, definitely. All right, we've got a question um, in the chat from Killian. How does the current cost of coal versus photovoltaic per kilowatt compare? A uh, good question. The good news is uh, just 10 years ago, that might not have been a favorable comparison, but because we actually have been investing, we actually have been installing new systems. We've been learning how to do it more efficiently. And believe it or not, the Chinese have helped us in a very big way because yes, they incentivize the production of photovoltaics. They created so many more than they could use immediately. They dumped them on the US market, forcing US manufacturers and uh, industry to figure, whoa, we've got to figure out how to get smarter and how to do this more cost effectively. The cost of photovoltaic cells have come down dramatically. There is a, um, is a, uh, a, a new volume that's out every year uh, that comes out producing a way of looking at energy from coal, from natural gas, from uranium, and comparing it to solar and comparing it to uh, things like wind power. And in almost all cases, solar and wind power are now becoming cheaper than existing electricity generation sources, particularly of new, but in many cases, uh, some of the old systems as well. So it's a good opportunity. We're seeing investments already happen big time. That's great to hear. All right, our next question is from Erica. What new or upcoming technology are you personally most excited about? I am excited about two things, really laying the foundation for energy harvesting by a much more productive use of those energies, reducing the demand, the need for energy so that we need smaller levels of energy harvesting, but then making the transition primarily with photovoltaics, which then becomes the ability to integrate 
light into electricity in the many different forms I shared with you on one of the slides. Uh, so it's a combination, it's a step function. If today we began introducing more efficient lighting, light emitting diodes, for example, uh, I've got I'm, my right now light shining on me is getting maybe 80 watts of lighting for, for about six watts of energy. Uh, if we move to things we can do today, we buy more time to allow the research to happen that then enables things like energy harvesting to come along. I'm really big on piezoelectric materials. I'm really big on thermal uh, and light waves into different forms of energy. There are so many different ways of getting it done, but we've got to make it happen. We've got to make the investments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I loved the, um, I mean, your slide uh, detailing how we might be able to use the motion of cars on roads, right, to gather the energy, Vibrations, right? yes, exactly Vibrations right. There, it's, yeah. Like there, there could be a lot of potential there. <laughs> I can hear that music in the background. Good, good, good vibrations. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, Christopher asks, if a home has PV on its roof, how much energy produced by them is lost? Assuming it's very little, don't we need to require PVs on every new dwelling? Did the California time. do something like this? Uh, well, in fact, let me refer back to the CU Boulder and my colleagues, Kristen Tedonio and uh, uh, Joe Smith. Uh, they built a home that requires only about seven kilowatts of electricity. They have electricity at that scale. The home is entirely powered by its own resources, including passive solar, pulling in heat from the windows, but any efficient design using that energy very effectively. Even at a uh, high altitude of Fraser, Colorado, and even with temperatures below freezing, minus 13, they're able to produce 100% of their energy entirely within that home. So we have the wherewithal to do it, and we need to move in that direction, providing the incentives, the greater awareness, the opportunities. We need to train more people like solar technicians, people who know how to evaluate, optimize arrangements to get it done, and then provide the financing so people can make that kind of a transition. Hmm. Absolutely. If I could add to that question a All little right. bit. Question oh. from Connor. Do you foresee the critical investments in new technologies coming more from governments or from the private sector? Good question. I, um, in fact, President Biden has proposed something like in the order of $2.3 trillion to begin upgrading our infrastructure, some of which would then become available for purposes of uh, green energy, uh, renewable energy, efficiency upgrades and the like. But that is government money, and I'm actually one that thinks that is a down payment on what we need to do. The large scale of money is on the order of 16 to 20 trillion dollars, so eight to 10 times bigger than what President Biden has proposed. And the big money has to come from private investment, not government. That is to say, if we invest in these technologies, they generate a return. The return becomes the income for both employment and for the financial people that we can really go big. I'm talking $20 trillion, one year's GDP over the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, but it's got to be private investment supported by smart policies and programs made available by the government, but with a return on that investment, whether government or whether private investment. We've got to really think not just in terms of cost, but also benefits. And we don't do a very good job of that. Yep. Yeah, that whole return on investment, right? It's exactly. Yeah huge factor that we don't consider. Um, all right, let's see. I think we got another one coming in from uh, Azentive. Um, mm -hmm. It says, Sun and Cat here, Skip. Uh, they want to thank you. And uh, they're saying since it's Earth Day, uh, they wanted to ask um, if these energy harvesting technologies that you're talking about um, follow any type of biomimicry science. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, um, we are alive with uh, science in, in the form of uh, the biomass forms, the interactions of systems, whether plants, animals, whether the mycelium on fungi down below the surface of the soil. We don't see so much that's happening. And the more we learn, for example, uh, one of my favorite scientists, a woman up in uh, BC, uh, Victoria, uh, University of Victoria, BC, 30 years ago, did a, an experiment that showed she shrouded a number of trees with a plastic bag, filled those bags with a radioactive carbon dioxide, and then began to see how other plants absorb that carbon dioxide. We found out that trees actually do talk to each other. They do share carbon dioxide. They do share phosphorus and nitrogen 
and they do inform each other when they're insects about to invade their area. Said, so you better get your water up to a level to drown those critters <laughs> if they have the water available to them. So that is one form of biomimicry that I think we need to take more of, hence my reference to the idea of a more collaborative, a greater awareness of the world around us. And biomimicry does provide a critical foundation. And I got to say hello to Kat. Good to hear you on, on, on the scene here. Thanks a lot. Kat, yeah. by the way, a, a of it is a, uh, a leading uh, investor, producer, if you will, of plasma lighting, another form of energy that becomes much more efficient in the use of lighting than we have today. More critically, it has a broader array of infrared that allows plants to grow more healthy and more quickly, even mm -hmm. as we use less in the way of electricity to grow those plants. So many huge opportunities. I apologize, Kat, I forgot to include that. All right, I think we have time for one last question here. Um, and since Erica, I've already, we've already answered one of your questions, I'm gonna to skip to Bruce's question here. Uh, what can we as public citizens do to motivate politicians to think differently about these issues? Two things, big question. I think. Yeah, big question. Uh, two things, one is we need to become better informed ourselves. We're so in the moment that we seldom take a moment back to learn, to reflect, to talk with each other. But as we become more informed and more enthusiastic ourselves, then to begin talking with business leaders in particular, asking them ways of opening up the markets that are smart in this kind of a direction. And as business leaders then become a little bit more proactive, talking to politicians saying, we've got to talk about costs and benefits, the benefits. We are under a huge problem that we're facing a grim reality unless we change. It's that hard decade or a very bad century that we've got to underscore. So more informed, more aware, more excited, and then talking with business leaders in the community, see how they might be able to participate, and then talking with our legislative policymakers. Right. Now let's make it happen, right? Let's do. Good idea. Do. All right, Skip. Well, thank you so much again for joining us today. Um, really valuable presentation and insightful comments. Brianna and Jeremy, a, a pure delight. And everybody, uh, look forward to making it happen. Bye yeah. for now. Thank you All so right. much, Skip. Take care. Bye. So now we'd like to transition to the second half of our event tonight, um, the premiere of our Climate Change in Our Backyard film. So this film began, began several years ago as part of a small grant supported by the University of Colorado Office of Outreach and Engagement. Our goal for this grant was to try to bring climate change to a more local lever, level, uh, try to connect people with the idea of climate change more directly, right? Because we hear about ice caps melting, sea levels rising, uh, but what does that mean for people who live inland in Colorado, for example, far away from the poles and rising tides? So this project ended up growing into two branches. Uh, we ended up establishing a regular live talk series at Fisk called, by the same name, Climate Change in Our Backyard, uh, that really explores the direct ways in which climate change impacts Colorado. The second branch of this project is this film that you're about to see now. Um, and given that we wanted to distribute the film to free for planetariums all over the world, we ended up generalizing just a little bit uh, so that it felt more relevant to audiences all over. Um, and just as a quick note, this film was really made for a 3D environment for you to be sitting under uh, the planetarium dome. And uh, it's a little bit difficult to take a sort of this 3D uh, view and flatten it into 2D. So I'm just going to give you a little example here. I have a, a dog bowl. Um, and normally, right, if we were watching this film that we're about to watch, we would be inside of the bowl watching all around us. Uh, but what we've done is we've smushed it like this. And so you're going to see this kind of a view where the top of the dome is right in the middle. It means the outside might look a little bit warped for that reason. Uh, but do stick around with us after the film, because then we'll have a live Q&A session with five of us who were involved in the making of the film. And with that, please enjoy Climate Change in Our Backyard.
Throughout human history, we have worked together in a quest to interpret our world. The need to expand our knowledge gave rise to the fields of science, including chemistry, physics, biology, and earth science. We have learned about many individual fields of study in great depth for the past few hundred years. Only in the past several decades, however, have our technology, intellect, and passions combined to give us the ability to put many of the pieces of knowledge together. We are now developing a much larger picture of our Earth as a whole. It unveils a complex, interconnected, remarkable... Throughout human history, we have worked together in a quest to interpret our world. The need to expand our knowledge gave rise to the fields of science, including chemistry, physics, biology, and earth science. We have learned about many individual fields of study in great depth for the past few hundred years. Only in the past several decades, however, have our technology, intellect, and passions combined to give us the ability to put many of the pieces of knowledge together. We are now developing a much larger picture about our Earth as a whole. It unveils a complex, interconnected, remarkable world, and it reveals the powerful influence we have had on our home planet. We begin perched high in Colorado's Rocky Mountains as the sun rises over Niwata Ridge. In this isolated place, away from the direct influence of civilization, scientists are gathering data. They measure things like air temperature, wind speed, water runoff, the types of plants growing, when they flower, and the amount of snow. These scientists have been tracking how these measurements change for over half a century. And their data reveal a distinctive story about how our backyard is changing. Within these large canisters, scientists are separating and measuring the gases that make up the air. Almost all of the gas is nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and water vapor. Other trace gases have been carefully measured as well, like carbon dioxide, commonly called CO2. Why would scientists care about CO2, a gas that makes up less than half of 1% of our atmosphere? To understand why, we need to take a closer look at our atmosphere. On a sunny day, we can feel the warmth of our star, but how does the air react to this energy? All hot objects, the sun, the earth, even your own body, radiate light. The color we see, the wavelength of the light, depends on the temperature of the object. The sun is a scorching 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or 5,500 degrees Celsius, meaning that it produces mainly visible light, the colors of the rainbow. After traveling across the vacuum of space for 93 million miles, or 150 million kilometers, this light encounters the Earth. Some of it bounces off of the planet, reflecting off of clouds and ice, and we see these things as white. Light that does not get reflected is absorbed by the planet's surface, heating it up. After being absorbed, this heat does not disappear. The laws of physics reveal that energy cannot be destroyed. Some of that energy, the Earth re-radiates back towards space. At the Earth's surface, which is much cooler than the Sun, this radiation is not a visible color. This invisible light can actually be felt as heat. Scientists call this radiation infrared because it has a wavelength that is longer than that of visible red light. Much of this infrared light does make it out directly into space, but some of it takes a detour along the way. The reason for the detour has to do with those certain very rare or trace molecules 
in Earth's atmosphere. Some molecules that are made of three or more atoms are extra sensitive to infrared light. When excited by the light, these molecules twist and vibrate. The same molecules don't get excited by light with shorter wavelengths, like the visible light from the sun. This is similar to how humans cannot hear the high-pitched or short wavelength sounds of a dog whistle, but we do get excited and even dance to the longer wavelength sounds of your favorite music. Infrared sensitive molecules warm the Earth by slowing the escape of infrared light back into space. A variety of molecules in Earth's atmosphere can do this, but CO2, methane, and water vapor are all particularly sensitive to infrared light and causes a warming effect. Now, this warming is a good thing in moderation. Without any of these molecules in our atmosphere, Earth's average temperature would hover near zero degrees Fahrenheit or minus 15 degrees Celsius. Instead, Earth is a comfortable average of 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius. The higher the concentration of these molecules, the more the atmosphere traps heat before it escapes, further warming the Earth's surface. Scientists measure that the relatively tiny concentrations of these gases have big effects. CO2's concentration is a fraction of a percent of the whole atmosphere, near 400 parts per million. That's like only 20 people in all of the seats of an average sports stadium. Yet, this small concentration is enough to have a noticeable effect on our climate and weather. These trace molecules that absorb infrared light are called greenhouse gases, and the effect they have on the temperature of Earth's surface in the atmosphere is called the greenhouse effect. The concentrations of greenhouse gases change through time and are important for changing the temperature and climate of our planet. How do scientists know that these concentrations change through time? They either need to measure them directly over and over by filling a canister with a sample of today's atmosphere or they need to find natural archives that have trapped samples of old atmosphere. Let's return to Niwot Ridge. From those canisters of air, scientists have found that the concentration of CO2 molecules in the atmosphere has been increasing since they started collecting data 50 years ago. Niwot Ridge is not unique. Scientists around the world have independently measured the same trend of increasing CO2. How will this trend influence the Earth's climate? We have seen that greenhouse gases, and CO2 in particular, play an important role in affecting the temperature of the Earth. Scientists have been investigating the effects of a changing CO2 concentration. This research has been happening for decades at places like Niwot Ridge, but a handful of decades is not very long if we're trying to get a bigger picture. Looking further back in time, before we began collecting and measuring air directly may seem like a challenge, but researchers have found some clever solutions. In Antarctica and Greenland, natural archives of air can be found in bubbles trapped in the thick ice caps. Year after year of falling snow compacts into ice, trapping air in the process. Scientists sample the trapped air by drilling ice cores as deep as two miles over three kilometers down. They go 10 meters at a time, like pushing a giant straw through a layer of cake. The further down the scientists drill into the ice, the further in the past they can observe the CO2 levels. The air bubbles in the ice provide a record of Earth's ancient atmosphere, allowing us to measure the history of CO2 concentrations over hundreds of thousands of years. Our measurements of the amount of CO2 over time shows that it goes through cycles. The amount of CO2 bounces between lower concentrations in ice ages and higher concentrations during warm periods, or what we call interglacial periods. CO2 has been doing this for at least 800,000 years, as far back as we have ice sample data. What causes these large natural cycles, and what makes them so regular and timed? We find an unexpected answer in research from the early 20th century. An astrophysicist named Milutin Milankovic was investigating how the Earth's movements change over time. Changes in Earth's tilt, wobble, and the shape of its orbit control how much sunlight is received at different points in the year, 
and how that sunlight is distributed across the globe. For example, the summer months of June and July in the Northern Hemisphere occur when Earth's axis is tilted towards the sun, coinciding with when the Earth is actually farthest from the sun. The reason Earth has seasons at all is because its axis is tilted. The Earth is currently tilted 23.4 degrees relative to its path around the sun. But over 41,000 years, this tilt varies between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees. The Earth is currently becoming less tilted, meaning that summers and winters should gradually be getting less extreme. But this isn't the only natural variation the Earth goes through. Over a period of about 26,000 years, the Earth itself wobbles like a top. This is called axial precession and it means that the North Star will no longer be Polaris in a few thousand years. This wobble will shift the timing of the seasons. The Northern Hemisphere's summer will happen in December, about 13,000 years from now. If we fly out, we can see that the Earth's orbit processes over 112,000 years, shifting the time of the year that the Earth is farthest from the Sun. This also affects the timing of the seasons. Even the shape of the Earth's orbit changes, oscillating between more circular and more oval, spanning 100,000 years. Our orbit fluctuates from 99 to 96% circular. Rooted in the interactions between the planets, gravitational pulls from the Sun, Jupiter, Saturn, and the Moon drive all the oscillations. Together, these slow changes combine to give Earth a complex dance how strong the seasons are and in what time of the year they happen. This dance has major effects on Earth's climate and ice age cycles. Altogether, this means that the intensity of sunlight reaching the Earth varies in a predictable way over time due to variations in our orbit. Natural changes in sunlight interact with Earth systems that influence CO2 levels, such as volcanoes, biological activity, and the oceans. This drives a cyclical greenhouse effect that changes Earth's global temperature. The air samples trapped in bubbles from ice cores have shown that the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has bounced between 180 and 280 parts per million over the past 800,000 years. This 100 parts per million variation or one hundredth of one percent change may seem small, but it contributes to the large variation in Earth's climate. The difference in average global temperatures between an ice age and an interglacial period is only 11 degrees Fahrenheit, or 6 degrees Celsius. Now, the natural pattern has been disrupted. Present CO2 concentrations have rapidly risen to exceed 400 parts per million. Fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas form over tens of millions of years from buried ancient organisms. When extracted and burned for energy, fossil fuels release huge amounts of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Humans in modern industrial civilization have figured out how to extract and use fossil fuels at an incredible pace. Worldwide, we consume over 4 billion gallons that's 15 trillion liters of oil per day. It took the Earth tens of millions of years to generate this resource, and only a fleeting moment to undo it. Up until now, the Earth has undergone regular patterns of global temperature changes due to natural sunlight and CO2 fluctuations. Today, we are drastically shifting the balance by adding vast amounts of CO2. How will this affect the Earth? and how could we figure out what to expect? The world of science relies on a process called peer review, where scientists share their research and other scientists try to find mistakes in their work. In doing so, the science community develops a more accurate picture of our home planet. Analyzing the history of Earth's climate, today's observations, and the laws of physics, it's possible to make more accurate predictions about our future. You can think of this as an everyday example. 
If you reach into a freezer and grab an ice cube and set it out on a plate, how long will it take to melt? To answer this accurately, we would need to know how cold is the ice cube, how warm is the room, and how big is the ice cube. Depending on our answers to these questions, we can use physics to model and therefore reliably predict how fast the ice cube will melt. Now imagine repeating this experiment millions of times. Your predictions of the melting ice cube would become much more accurate. Icebergs and glaciers are Earth's giant ice cubes. How long will it take them to melt? Scientists around the world are collectively taking millions of measurements of our environment to model how it will change over time. However, modeling the interconnected climate system can get very complex. Scientists use powerful supercomputers to do billions of calculations. The amount and types of data used, the detail of the model, and the laws of physics incorporated all lead to slightly varied predictions from different teams of scientists. Despite the variability in the models, however, they all point to the same general prediction. Our Earth is warming and will continue to do so until we can decrease CO2 levels. How will we prepare to face a changing Earth? Some models show that if we curb our emissions, the worst consequences such as sea level rise, ocean acidification, severe weather, drought, and population displacement can be reduced. We can each make decisions on a personal, local, and commercial level that add up to a global difference. We can have an impact by reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, thereby emitting less CO2 into the atmosphere. Renewable energy production is a common strategy for reducing carbon emissions. Solar panels and wind turbines can be placed in many different locations, including parking garages, road signs, and the roofs of schools, businesses, or your own home. Architectural design choices can also have a big impact on energy consumption. Some of the most advanced passive cooling technologies were developed from ancient Arabic and Persian architecture. These clever designs use carefully positioned vents to maximize airflow and minimize heating from sunlight. Modern architecture can make use of these same principles, minimizing energy used for heating and cooling. You may have heard of LEED certification, which recognizes buildings that use less energy, save money, and provide sustainable solutions. We can all make daily choices that collectively reduce our energy consumption, benefiting our families and communities. Walking, biking, carpooling, or using public transportation more frequently reduces your CO2 production and air pollution. LED light bulbs in our houses are much more energy efficient. Purchasing local food supports our community farmers and reduces fossil fuel consumption from importing food. People from all areas and occupations have been extremely creative and thoughtful about developing strategies to respond to climate change and move us away from the warmer Earth that models are predicting. From the remote mountain shack of Niwot Ridge, through ancient bubbles in Antarctic ice, and into our own homes, we have explored how and why our climate is changing. Human carbon emissions are warming our planet and will continue to do so until we do something about it. Millions of dedicated citizens are taking action. Tens of thousands of researchers have devoted their careers to climate science. Engineers are building sustainable technologies, while forward-thinking leaders and entrepreneurs are enacting strategies for the future. Countless people like you and me are witnessing climate change in our own backyards and making small adjustments in our lives to reduce our carbon emissions. We can all make a difference. The most important thing we can do is keep talking about climate change with our families, friends, and leaders. We all share the future.
All right. Welcome back, everybody. I hope everybody enjoyed that film. And you may notice there's a couple more folks on here now. We're sitting here with uh, some of the creators of this film. Um, we're going to open it up for a little bit of Q&A. I've been uh, trying to keep track of anybody's questions as, you were, as they were coming in uh, as the film was going. And why don't we just go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit, a bit about yourself and kind of maybe what you uh, worked on to uh, make this film happen. So I guess it's it's me going first, Bob Anderson. I'm uh, I'm currently the chair of the geology department here at, at CU Boulder. I'm a formerly a geomorphologist, so I study the Earth's surface, and that includes everything from you know coastal cliffs to sand dunes to glaciers. So I've spent a fair bit of time working on the icy parts of the landscape, from the high alpine glaciers in Colorado and Alaska to the big ice sheets, the edges of the big ice sheets to permafrost in Alaska. Uh, and I teach in the geology de department here. I've taught here for almost 20 years. Before that, I taught at UC Santa Cruz in uh, California. On to the next. Um, hi, my name's Erica Schreiber. Uh, working on this film, happened while I was a PhD student at the National Snow and Ice Data Center at CU. I'm now working as an engineer at a nonprofit called UNAVCO. And uh, my dissertation was on sea ice in the Arctic. And my job now is focused on uh, the ice sheet in Antarctica, primarily um, studying the, the motion of the ice down there. Cool, I'm Tasha Snow. And I was a script writer and science advisor in this video. And while we were making this, I was a PhD student at the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences um, at CU Boulder. And now I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Colorado School of Mines. Um, most of my work has been using remote sensing, satellite imagery mostly, to look at um, glacier ocean interactions so glaciology and oceanography together um, in both Greenland and Antarctica. I'm Thor Metzinger. I'm video producer at Fisk Planetarium. So it was my uh, role to help lead uh, the visual department team in helping produce this film for the planetariums. Uh, to note that this film is being distributed across the world uh, freely to planetariums uh, you know, all over the place from little tiny inflatable planetariums in the middle of nowhere uh, to major planetariums uh, throughout, throughout the world. So we're really excited that, uh, you know, this story and this information is getting out to uh, the teachers and to the general public. Great, and I'm Brianna Ingerman. We've met already. Um, I am, as mentioned before, the education manager at Fisk Planetarium. Um, and actually when I took this job, uh, this project was kind of passed along to me from uh, my predecessor, Matt Benjamin. And uh, so it was kind of the first major project that I was, was overseeing while, while at Fisk. Uh, so I was kind of the co-producer, helped out with script writing, just kind of um, all of the back end details, logistics, getting everybody together for meetings, all that sort of thing. Um, but we're really excited to share this with all of you today. So glad you could all join us. Thank you. Excellent. Well, yeah, we are very, uh, very thankful for all of you guys to be able to give your time and come spend uh, the, the, the uh, evening with us. Um, it looks like we have a couple of questions starting to roll in. Um, so Christopher, I think this, this might be just an open question uh, for anybody who wants to uh, ask it, but he asks, one of the controversies since 2013 IPCC is whether humanity should use the 100-year GWP numbers or the 20-year GWPs, which include methane being 84 times worse than CO2. His question is, which GWPs do you think should be the guide for our actions? And I'm actually gonna show my ignorance here and say that I don't quite know what GWPs is. So if any of you know here sitting on this panel with me, what is GWPs? 
global warming pathway. Yeah, probably. Right. Uh, there were a number, uh, I'll, I'll speak at least briefly, there were a number of uh, pathways laid out in the IPCC reports, uh, which come out every few years, updating our current knowledge of the state of climate and projections of how that climate might look in the future. And those various projections are based upon assumptions that are made about what humanity is going to do in terms of producing the various greenhouse gases that are uh, tweaking our uh, uh, the radiative balance on the on the Earth, and those radiative uh, those those pathways um, range from uh, way higher than present, and we don't do anything to to uh, alter the CO two production to very uh, uh, politically difficult uh, pathways that, that actually ramp us down in terms of, of CO2 production. So the question presumably is about which of those various pathways should be, we be planning on? And uh, the worst case scenario is obviously the one to, to be um, planning around as, a, as just that, a worst case. Um, I think that what I've seen is that that worst case has been uh, backed up. That if, as you go from one IPCC report to another, um, the one that the projections that appear to be the most correct ones are the most extreme ones. I'm not an expert on this, but that's my sense. And uh, it's certainly the case that in the Arctic, uh, in the northern Arctic, uh, that the rate of change of land surface temperatures and the permafrost temperatures up there have exceeded our expectations in terms of warming. And this is all part of a uh, what is called a polar amplification or Arctic amplification of climate, where the climate change is going to be the most extreme, the most amplified at the poles. And this is certainly happening in the Arctic, as far as we can see, with various feedbacks getting into the game. But I'll stop there. It's the edge of my knowledge. <laughs> Great. Does anybody else have anything uh, to add? We had uh, some clarification from Christopher in the, in the chat on what GWPs means. But if anybody else has anything to add uh, down that track. Nope. I'll just say I agree. We we have been basically following the the worst case projections so far. So without any huge shifts, that's probably what we should count on and plan for. And also, it's always best to plan for the worst. Of course, yeah. I think is what Bob was leaning on. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so yeah, so Christopher was clarifying that he was talking about global warming potentials, um, and he I guess was saying that. Uh, the, there's some controversies whether we should be following the 100 year global warming potential numbers or the 20 year global warming potentials. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Okay, we will uh, contact you, Christopher, or you can feel free to shoot us an email. Um, our link is down below in the description, and we'll get back to you on that one. Uh, any other questions coming in in the chat? Um, when we're waiting for some other kind of questions come in I guess uh, a more simple question that I always have for filmmakers like this because it seems like always there's so much work that goes into it and when you watch you know a, ha a 30 minute film it can I feel like a lot of the work um, can almost be glazed over and brushed over a little bit so I guess for everybody what was the most challenging or f frustrating part about getting this film all together so many iterations of the script. <laughs> iterations, okay. <laughs> we were yeah. actually joking behind the scenes that we were all here to actually make another version of the script now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think we got together. Oh, I can't even see. I mean, we went through probably 15, 12, 15 iterations of the script and all these like minor details along the way. <laughs> How many years did this take? Yeah, yeah. it definitely took a number of years. <laughs> I believe it was it my... <laughs> Five years ago, four years ago that we started this? Yeah. 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 yeah, I, I gonna... definitely say, oh, 
sorry. Uh, I was definitely going to say the script writing, but also deciding what stories to include in this because we had so many options. Mm. There were so many different things that we could talk about, so many myths, you know, so so much background that's important in climate change and so much evidence. And so kind of picking and choosing what was the most important, I think, was we went through a lot of iterations on that. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the diversity and just the volume of information that was at our disposal for this film could have easily been five or six or 10 films, right? So just culling that information down to like, what do we really need to communicate to people so they understand what's happening? I think was, you know, part of that script writing process is like, oh, you know, we're getting way too detailed here and too general there. So we need to keep balancing that. Uh, so I, I, I agree. I think it was difficult to, to balance the, the detail that we, we have as scientists uh, in our knowledge of how the climate works or uh, in, in, say, an ice core in a particular place in the Arctic or Antarctic versus the general problem that we have to set up. And, and there's only so much time in a 15, 20 minute film. I was always arguing that we really need to make sure that, we, uh, that the audience understands how greenhouse gases actually work. It's cast around as this, this very uh, uh, sim simple sounding notion of, of a greenhouse, but it's actually significantly more complicated than that. And, and it's an incorrect analogy in many ways. So trying to squeeze that part of the story in, making sure that we nailed that detail down about that fundamental driver of climate change at present was part of my task slash frustration. <laughs> yeah, we definitely, we definitely got into the vibrating dancing molecules uh, regarding like greenhouse gases. That was Bob's favorite uh, think, analogy. One of the, uh, I think one of my favorite components of the film was speaking as an artist, right? Um, was actually working with scientists and being able to, you know, bring the field into people's experience. And I think that's one thing that I, I really enjoyed is that when we get to see people working, you know, in a snowfield in the Arctic, in the Antarctica, you realize that this, these are real people, right? They're dedicating their whole career to making sure the science is as accurate as possible. And there's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of scientists doing this around the world every day. And being able to bring that and make that real to people. Because I think if I had to make a generalization, a lot of people think that these numbers are just coming from computers without any kind of like substance, right? Well, the data is coming from people, right? The data is coming from instruments that are being run by teams of scientists and, and being able to show that this is real stuff that's happening. And I think that was one of my favorite elements of producing this film. Yeah, I'll add to that. Um, I believe that there's footage from field work that both Tasha and I did um, a few years ago. And I think that for, for me, that's one of the things that really holds it together is uh, like being part of collecting this data and analyzing this data and then bringing it to the broad, uh, out to a broader area where the general public can hopefully understand it. I know we, we thought, not thought, but we had a lot of conversations about like very precise language and what is exactly correct, what can people understand and making sure that uh, we're, we're actually able to teach, not just throw a bunch of numbers, a bunch of data, a bunch of facts at people, but show the story, show uh, that it is, the basics of it are understandable, I think, to a general audience. Okay. Uh, I, I'd add one, one of the fascinating things to me, and it, this comes to, you know, I've taught for 30 years and uh, often, you know, we teach from slides and now PowerPoint slides and so on. I think there's a, an awful lot of power in the moving image. And this kind of venue allows us to explore the power of the moving image of the video. This is the modern way 
to teach and it's broadened my horizons as a, as a professor. I should also note the, uh, my affiliation with INSTAR, the Institute for Arctic and Alpine Research with which I'm uh, closely affiliated as well as the geology department. But I, and I think all of us at the institutes that we're affiliated with and in the departments, I think better understand the power of the moving image in our teaching and transferring our knowledge to the public as a powerful tool. Great. I'm gonna oh. plug into that really quickly. Go for it. Uh, just because I loved it so much um, and I just found it recently was there's a VR version of this video that I highly recommend you searching for. It's uh, just search for climate change in our backyard, VR. You can move the screen around. You can see what it looks like if you were actually in um, the dome in this planetarium. So uh, that's yeah. a great resource if you, if you end up wanting to watch it again. Yep. And well, they did an excellent job producing this. Yeah, we can go ahead and just link that. It's uh, on Fix Planetarium's uh, YouTube channel. And I'll go ahead and make sure that we just link that in the, the description of this film as well. And Good kind thing. of going with uh, that question, uh, Kayla wants to know, how will we be distributing this film slash advertising the film to other planetariums? And will it be available to the general public uh, in any, any other ways besides just the YouTube format? Uh, well, I can answer that. Yeah, so if you go to the uh, fisk.colorado.edu, or is it colorado.edu slash fisk, um, our website, Fisk Planetarium, uh, you'll find the productions webpage. Uh, you can sign up for our productions network. Uh, we just ask for simple information, uh, name, you know, email address, and some basic information about the planetarium. Uh, and then you get free access to all of our productions, not just climate change in your own backyard. Um, it's freely distributed um, and you can show it to as many audiences as you can show it to. Um, we really are here as an educational planetarium to produce content to help people learn. Um, so if you're interested, please, you know, check out uh, the production webpage and you'll get, you'll gain access, uh, you know, within five minutes, you'd be able to start downloading the film for your planetarium. Yep, and I went ahead and included that link in the chat as well right now, and we'll make sure we uh, put it in the description behind it uh, or after it, once this is posted. Uh, yeah, Brianna, go ahead. Yeah, I can also just add that um, it's looking likely that we'll be able to, if you're here in Colorado, uh, it's looking like that we'll be able to open the doors to this planetarium sometime this summer, um, fingers crossed, and uh, then we'll be showing this film in the dome, um, so you can buy tickets to that as well, uh, coming here soon. Yeah, and uh, so I do want to be, um, you know, aware of everybody's time and respectful of everybody's time here on Earth Day. I know there's plenty of other events that you guys probably want to get on over to. Um, so thank you to our panelists. Um, I just would like to go around and ask for kind of any final thoughts on uh, this day, this movie, life in general, anything else for you from you guys. I would recommend... I'll just say happy, I'll just say happy Earth Day to everyone. Uh, this is the 51st of these, I remember the first, and uh, it's always a special day to re-engage in the stewardship of this planet. So I wish you all well. I would echo that statement. I would say lately a resource that I've found really inspiring is Project Drawdown and the book Drawdown um, has lots of the kind of the top 100 most uh, ways that we can have a positive impact on climate change and it's been it's been really illuminating. All right. Is that Sorry. anybody else have anything else to join in? I, I would echo the positive uh, notion that that Brianna brought up that it's really easy on a topic like this uh, with climate change and other environmental topics to get pretty negative. Um, but that doesn't that doesn't, that's not what's gonna change things. Um, and there is a lot of opportunity for us to change the current situation. And there are lots of resources out there to learn about that. Um, 
So don't don't get all gloom and doom. Have a have a good Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Asha. Yeah, and I think I think wrapping back into what Skip talked about, there's a lot of potential with with energy and the changes that you know the ad new administration is trying to push through. So I have a positive outlook for the future. A lot of my work, you know, deals with watching giant icebergs break off of giant state sized glaciers, uh, which is super exciting, but also can be pretty sad. But uh, it's amazing how resilient some of these systems can be. And I'm um, hopeful for, you know, the changes that we're going to bring about in the next couple decades. Um, I'll just end with happy Earth Day. And I would recommend that everybody plant as many trees as you possibly can because your grandchildren will thank you for the shade. So it's a kind Excellent. of about thinking forward, right? It's, you get to enjoy the tree, but eventually one day that tree will be a 150 foot giant oak, right? And it will provide somebody else's benefit. So plant trees. Plant trees. Excellent. Well, thank you once again, everybody, uh, our panelists. Okay. Thank you, Skip, earlier for joining in. And thank you uh, to all of you that joined in on the YouTube verse out there in the YouTube verse. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, if anybody else has anything else, uh, happy Earth Day. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank if you, you enjoyed our program and you want to help support us, you can donate. We put a link in the, in the down below. Thanks again. Have a great night. Good night. Thank you.